you swift me. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the small Easter eggs, references, and other cool details you might have missed while watching Rick and Morty. Now look, it's like a Where's Waldo page. Can you find me? Check out all these zany characters. Number 20, Mr. Poopy Butthole predicts the season 3 premiere. Remember the days when the time between Rick and Morty's seasons was nebulous and unpredictable? It was a stressful time for us super fans, but apparently, we should have been paying more attention to Mr. Poopy Butthole for exact release dates. The season 2 finale ends with the cliffhanger of Rick being locked up in a maximum security Galactic Federation prison. We then get a fourth wall breaking Mr. Poopy Butthole teasing when we might see the storyline get resolved. Tune in to Rick and Morty season 3 and like a year and a half or longer to see how we unravel this mess. Thankfully, or longer, didn't turn out to be the time frame for the season three premiere. Indeed, season two ended on October 4th, 2015, and season three began on April 1st, 2017, the difference of which is almost a year and a half, just as Mr. Poopy Butthole said. We see you for season four in like a really long time. I I might even have a big white Santa Claus beard. Number 19, Fake Real Websites. In the season six episode, Full Meta Jack Rick, Story Lord meets his creator, a writer named Jan working for Citadel Toys. Jan fences frustrations with his assignment, in addition to the URL the company used for Story Train. Story Dash Train? Who uses a dash? At the end of the episode, Jan is compelled to kill Story Lord, but Rick says he has to do it with a promotional toy. Joseph Campbell says you have to be the one to put him down. Wait, 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 Joseph Campbell also says you have to use this brand new limited edition Rick Plush available only on rick-plush.biz. Supplies are limited. Act now. He did? <laughs> Funnily enough, if you actually go to story-train.com, you'll be redirected to the show page on the Adult Swim website. And if you go to rick-plush.biz, you'll see an actual advertisement for a Rick Plush doll. Unfortunately, it's unavailable in this reality. The show's limits for meta humor knows no bounds. Jesus, that's the last time I buy a toy from a Rick. The plushies are obviously well made. Number 18, Rick Dance. This episode had us all trying out the Rick Dance, and we didn't need collapsing crystals to do so, but apparently one alien did. In the first season finale, Rick throws a massive intergalactic party when Jerry and Beth are away. Morty tracks down special crystals thinking it'll get them home, but all he really does is provide Rick with party favors. It's the, it's the, it's the Rick Dance. Now in the groove, Rick leads the guests in one of his signature dances, but Morty kills the vibe by tossing the remaining crystals outside. From there, a giant creature scoops them up in the backyard, and while Morty continues to lay into Rick, we can see the buzzing monster doing its own version of the Rick dance. Number 17, Customs Aliens. The Glarp Zone is for flarping and unglarping only. Rick and Morty has always worn its admiration for science fiction on its sleeve, as evidenced by the pilot episode. In it, Rick tries to get mega tree seeds back home and uses Morty as a drug mule when they go through interdimensional customs. A fun chase sequence ensues, but the focus of this entry comes with the scene's establishing shot. If you look closely at the various creatures populating the main floor, you can spy silhouettes of various sci-fi characters from pop culture. These include a xenomorph from the Alien movies, Quark from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Mystery Science Theater 3000's Tom Servo, Crow T. Robot, and Gypsy, and, for some reason, Big Bird and Mr. Snuffleupagus. Oh, hello, Bird. Hello, Snuffy. Oh. Say hello to my little pal Elmo here. Where? Oh, oh, hello, Elmo. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. Number 16, R.I.P. Frank Palicki. Uh, morning, Frank. Morning? What, what, is that? what is that supposed to mean? Make fun of me? Are you trying to say my family's poor? Speaking of the pilot, when Rick wants Morty to come with him on his search for the Mega Tree Seeds, he intervenes in a violent encounter between Morty and the school meanie Frank Palicki by freezing the kid on the spot. We naturally expect Frank to eventually thaw, but instead, he soon tips over and shatters into countless pieces. Hi, Frank. It's a rough way to go, but it leads to a subtle and very morbid gag later on. When we return to school later in the episode, we can see the American flag outside at half-mast, whereas prior to Frank's death, it wasn't. We imagine the school bulletin announcing Frank's passing was difficult to explain. What kind of god let this happen? <sighs> we had a little incident, a student was frozen to death. And there's no evidence that a Latino student did it. Everyone wants to take this to a racial place, I won't let them. 
Number 15, I'm Mr. Meeseeks, look at the background. I'm Mr. Meeseeks, look at me! While numerous wacky characters are mere one-offs, the Mr. Meeseeks episode was so well received that it practically demanded the scrawny blue guy make reappearances. Mr. Meeseeks also makes memorable cameos, but there are a few instances where the animators have simply drawn him into the background. When we first visit the intergalactic arcade Blips and Chits, a Meeseeks can be seen giving advice to a gamer behind Rick and Morty. In the Morty's Mind Blowers episode, the memory of them in the collector's menagerie shows a pair of Meeseeks trapped in their own display, and based on their agony, we'd say they've been existing for far too long. Existence is pain to a Meeseeks, Jerry! And we will do anything to alleviate that pain! Number 14, Human Music. In the episode M. Night Sham Aliens, an alien race called the Zygerians trap Rick and Morty in endless simulations. Oh, and Jerry too, but that was an accident. In an effort to keep Jerry pacified and unaware of his reality, the Zygerians approximate their best interpretation of human music. However, it's so simplistic that not even babies would find it entertaining, which of course means it's perfect for Jerry. This is Earth Radio. Now, here's human music. Hmm. Human music. I like it. A season later, Rick drops Jerry off at the Jerry Bury, an essential daycare for Jerry's from different realities. It's a Jerry paradise, as evidenced by the human music being faintly played in the background. Well, look at this fella. Aren't you handsome? Thank you. I'm Jerry. <laughs> oh, I know you are. Did you come here in a spaceship? So did Rick lift the human music from the Zygerions, or was he in charge of the simulation all along? Why don't you ask the smartest people in the universe, Jerry? Oh yeah, <laughs> you can't. They blew up. Number 13, Venusian. This one's obvious for any French-speaking viewers, but it actually goes a little deeper than that. In the episode where Beth and Space Beth fall in love and pull a San Junipero, they bond over Venusian wine, prompting Space Beth to implant in her counterpart the ability to speak the planet's language. Maintenant, tu connais Venusienne. Oh mon dieu, ça a l'air si chic. Je vous remercie. Clearly, this is just French, but if Venus is known for their amorous ways, then what better than the language of love? French was also chosen because Beth's voice actor, Sarah Chalk, is fluent in it, in addition to German. Funnily enough, though, six episodes later, actual Venusians make an appearance, and they're definitely not speaking French. The suns of the moon can attack the sun. Why should the Viscounts of Venus continue sitting in Saturn's shadow? We're guessing they too have language implants. Number 12, Shelved Time Travel. For as science fiction heavy as the show can be, it's largely stayed away from one of the genre's most prominent storytelling devices, time travel. Creators Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon have both made it known that they aren't fond of those kinds of narratives, citing that it's well-trod ground. While Roiland is no longer affiliated with the show, it seems like Rick too isn't a fan. Arnaldo's isn't closed in the dimension where they didn't invent daylight savings! What would we do without you? I love you, Dad. Love you too, sweetie. By the way, that wasn't time travel. There were just a couple pizzas on the counter. I grabbed them. To his credit, Rick could probably invent almost anything, and he seemingly has tinkered with time travel before, as he's had a box on his garage shelf labeled time travel stuff forever. So, in a way, the show has literally shelved the idea of time travel. We're removing ourselves from this sloppy f***ed up story and letting snake time travel eat its own tail. Number 11, Tobias Funke. Going back to the M. Night Shyamalan's episode, its biggest guest star is actor David Cross, who voices the Zygerion leader, Prince Nebulon. Well, what could this possibly be? Because it looks like you're inside a simulation, inside a simulation. Nebulon, like the other Zygerions, is extremely disgusted by nudity, which Rick uses to his advantage to buy him and Morty some privacy, even though Morty is also a simulation. God, sir, they're still naked! Ugh. Well, check every five quintons and tell me when they're not. It's a funny bit, but considering Cross's most famous role, it makes it even more sense. On the sitcom Arrested Development, Cross played Tobias Fumke, who suffers from Never Nude Syndrome, meaning he has a strong aversion to letting anyone see him naked, including himself. I'll never understand that you can never be nude. I understand more than you'll never know. It's a neat character connection, and Cross unsurprisingly plays both to perfection. Number 10, House Damages. In the day-to-day -day of Rick's adventures, not everything remains intact. Wait, what? Was the house 
When we pulled up, I could have sworn the house was completely trashed. Hey, you can't make an omelet without cracking a few planets, right? In many cases, the destruction wrought by Rick, Morty, and whatever intergalactic presence they're pissing off this week is repaired, with the Smith Sanchez household as good as new by the next episode. But not always. God damn it. At the end of season one, the house and part of the lawn are transported to another dimension. When they're returned, a huge crack is left across the driveway. The crack never fully goes away, with Jerry weed whacking it later in season two's autoerotic assimilation. In that same season, Summer accidentally blasts a hole in the garage roof. It remains lazily repaired with boards for subsequent episodes. Look, I'm your father and I love you is all I'm saying. I'll leave it at that. Fine, Dad. Oh, he might have said to take it outside. Number nine, Jerry misses Doofus Rick. Jerry has it rough. Despised by his father-in-law and disrespected by his family, he's less the head of the household and more the butt of every joke. I guess this is what rock bottom feels like, Jerry. Ow! Yes, he's sort of a mess, but it's not like he's the most terrible person on the planet. <coughs> Rick. <coughs> the lonely Jerry is therefore astounded when he makes a friend, Rick of Earth Dimension J19 Zeta 7, aka Doofus Rick. Hey, get a load of this. Jerry's hanging out with Doofus Rick. <laughs> oh, this is perfect. I'm not Doofus Rick. I'm Rick J19 Zeta 7. Oh, is that the timeline where everybody eats poop? The two part ways at the end of Close Rick Counters of the Rick kind. I love you, Jerry. I love you. But evidence that Jerry still thinks of his friend crops up in a later episode. In it, a picture of Doofus Rick, along with a Titanic model and jar of applesauce, can be seen hidden on a shelf in the garage, likely placed there by Jerry. 19 z to set Stowaway Parasite. Roughly halfway into season two, the Smith family home becomes infested with a pest far worse than most. Don't like glowing rocks in the kitchen trash. Well, I don't like your unemployed jeans and my grandchildren, Jerry. The parasite moves from person to person, creating false memories and identities in a bid to repopulate the planet. They embed themselves in memories, and then they use those to multiply and spread out and take over planets. It's, it's disgusting. While Morty eventually figures out how to defeat them, the show never elaborates on how they got inside in the first place. My wife! What the hell? I figured it out, Rick. The parasites can only create pleasant memories. I know you're real because I have a ton of bad memories with you. However, two episodes earlier, at the end of Morty Night Run, Rick loads up his spaceship with green crystals. A pink egg-like lump is clearly visible on one of the rocks. Later, Rick is seen dumping those same green crystals in the trash. As the dead aliens are shown to have similar pink lumps on their spines, the crystals are most likely the culprit. Number seven, Eric Stoltz. Rick and Morty started off as a riff on the 1985 classic Back to the Future. My calculations are correct. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious The parody, which followed Doc Smith and Marty McDonald on their horrible adventures. All right, Doc, I'm back. I got my boots. I'm excited. Let's go. Let's get out of here. Somehow spawned the much more enjoyable Rick and Morty. With that and a little Back to the Future trivia in mind, we get our next entry. The original casting of Marty McFly, who later became Morty Smith, was not Michael J. Fox, but Eric Stoltz. Perhaps in some parallel dimension, Stoltz was never recast. And in season one's close Rick counters of the Rick kind, there is an Eric Stoltz version of Morty, albeit in his role as Rocky Dennis from the film Mask. That's right, Jerry! He, he's from a reality where everyone is Eric Stoltz mask people! This film was also released in 1985, four months before Back to the Future summer release. Number six, you are always wrong. When Morty accidentally becomes a father after procuring an alien sex robot, Rick and Summer head off to the robot's planet of origin to find out what's what. Gazorpazorp in the Andromeda system. Scoot, Summer. Don't you need a new companion now that Morty's in the family way? I don't do adventures with chicks, Summer. On Gazorpazorp, they find a world sharply divided by gender. The females, proud, beautiful, and hilariously passive aggressive, are the dominant gender. I am here if you need to talk. I am here if you need to talk. The males, subjugated for their reproductive purposes, have devolved into violently horny monsters. I said thanks, Dum Dum. Go get more. When Rick offends the females, he is put on trial. Yeah, you know what I have to say about that? As he and Summer approach the judge's throne, the Latin phrase, Sisemper Columinum, becomes visible. Unless you can read old languages, this might go right past you. However, it roughly means, you are always wrong, or, if it's a reference to a passage in Deuteronomy, constant oppression. In any case, justice is far from blind on Gazorbazorp. 
Number 5. Summer is Jerry with different hair. Of all the Smith Sanchez family members, Morty is the only one with his own distinct look. No one else has that round little noggin. Beth and Rick have similar characteristics like their oval face, and of course substance use, but that's a whole other topic. But it's Jerry and Summer who are dead ringers for each other. Dad, what's going on? What's the deal here? They literally look exactly the same, especially as Summer is the only leading female character not to wear makeup. She has no eyelashes and no lipstick. I spent a lot on this top. Side by side, Summer and Jerry are identical, each just sporting different hair and clothes. We'd say like father like daughter, but skin deep is where the similarities begin and end. Number 4. Rick's Musical Past Rick is secretly a musician. Before it was directly mentioned, we were given hints to his musical past throughout the series. When a race of giant heads suck Earth into an intergalactic talent contest, a frustrated Morty bails on the whole situation and has to be rescued by Bird Person. Morty. Bird Person? You appear to be dying. I will make efforts to prevent this, but can promise nothing. Huh. At his house, he sees photos of Bird Person's life, one of which shows him in a band with Rick and Squanchy called Flesh Curtains. Rick's musical aptitude also gets a nod in Big Trouble in Little Sanchez when Tiny Rick writes and performs a song on the spot. This next one's coming straight from the heart, making the lyrics up right off the top of my head. Let me out, what you see is not the same person as me, my life's a lie, I'm not who you're looking at. And later in season three, in the ABCs of Beth, Rick is seen fiddling around on a guitar as he writes the song Doo Doo Butt. Doo Doo, Doo Doo Butt, no. Perhaps he never lost his musical flair, Number 3. Harmon and Roiland Cameos Most creators like to subtly put themselves in their work, and Harmon is no exception, nor was Roiland. In Season 1, the family pet turned dictator Snowball transports all the dogs on Earth to a new world in reference to Roiland's earlier project, Dog World. Wow, a whole world populated by intelligent dogs. I wonder what it'll be like, Rick. I think it'll be great, Morty. You know, it's, it, it, it could be developed in, into a very satisfying project for people of all ages. I mean, I'd watch it, Morty, for at least 11 minutes a pop. In autoerotic assimilation, Rick dictates the plot of a fictional TV show as it airs, but in fact describes scenes from Harmon's previous show, Community. Now make them all make fun of the blonde one. Now make them all do it on the table. Can't believe you created a whole show for me. Now cancel it. Okay, now put it back on. <laughs> All right, I'm bored. The following episode, Total Rick Call, features a Nintendo flipping scheme that Justin Roiland actually attempted. You guys, we gotta hurry. I just got back from Walmart. They're selling Nintendo 3DS systems for $149.99 on sale. Plus, every time you buy one, you get a $50 gift card. And when three people are sacrificed to the giant heads and get Swifty, the sacrifice labeled Thief is drawn to resemble Justin Roiland. Finally, the closing card, Harmonious Claptrap, follows Dan Harmon's relationship status, from marriage to divorce and life with his new girlfriend. Number 2. Gravity Falls Crossovers Several shoutouts between Gravity Falls and Rick and Morty creators Alex Hirsch and Justin Roiland have been made. Yeah, welcome to the club, pal. Rick and Morty's Big Trouble in Little Sanchez features a small image of Gravity Falls antagonist Bill Cipher in the corner of a computer screen. A pair of Mortys wearing Mabel and Dipper headgear can be seen in the background of the Rick Shank Rickdemption. All the different Ricks from all the different realities got together to hide here from the government. As for Gravity Falls, the real-life publication of Dipper's Journal No. 3 features a replica of Ford's Wanted poster with the message Rick was here written in code. And when Grunkle Stan loses a notebook, pen, and mug into a giant portal, Every Hey, it's getting strong. Ah! <laughs> yes! Those three items are spat out of a portal Rick opens in close recounters of the Rick kind. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Walter White's House after being arrested by the Galactic Federation, Rick shows a Federation agent his memory of the day he perfected portal technology. Is that me? I used to wear blue pants. The memory shows him at his family home, at work in his garage, and happily married before his family is blown up. No! Compelling, but fake a false recollection used to facilitate his escape from the brainalyzer. The code you just uploaded wasn't actually my portal gun formula, it was a virus giving me full control over the brainalyzer. What are you talking about? This is a memory. You, you can't alter details of a memory. True, but you can alter anything you want about a totally fabricated origin story. But if you, the viewer, thought there was something familiar about the old Sanchez place, 
You were right. That's because the house Rick creates is a replica of Walter White's house from the critically acclaimed Breaking Bad, right down to the hedges. See, if the Federation spent more time watching groundbreaking television instead of trying to do whatever it is they do, they would still have a government. Were there any crazy things we missed? Get Swifty down in the comments. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.